exactly what we've been uh, teaching and talking about in it. That's a good find. Well, you know, they say when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. I, I've been thinking uh, about this text we're going to do this morning in that uh, Peter and all the other 120 people birthed the church. We studied that last week. First day of the church. And today Peter's going to give us the first sermon that was ever preached in the church age. You know, one of the things I envision about heaven, and I will stand corrected by the Lord if I'm wrong, but I, I truly believe eternity means that our fellowship is going to be uninterrupted. Amen. That I'm not going to have to be in a hurry to say hi to you and walk away. <laughs> that we're all going to have plenty of time to sit down and visit and come to know the stories, and the glories of every everyone that we know and ones that we'll meet. There's going to be people there that are going to say to us, I'm from the antediluvian age, the age of Adam and Enoch and Noah. There's going to be some people to talk to up there that are from the time of the judges and from the time of the kings and the time of the prophets. But there's going to be a lot of people up there that are from the church age. And that's you. That's me. We have been sovereignly placed by God at this particular time to live that is called the church age. And last week when we studied the, the uh, Holy Spirit falling, the, the, the tongues of other languages, the flames of fire that set on people's head, all symbolize the first day of the church. And if you remember it close last week with the big crowd, the big crowd gathered around them and they were all going, what's the matter with these people? Are they drunk? And I guess Peter had to sit, you know, clarify that a little bit because he got up and said, these people aren't drunk. It's only the nine o'clock in the morning. And so he stands up and he's going to give us the text of the sermon that we're going to study today, which is, as I said, the very first sermon of the church age. And I want to, and I pray that you'll be mindful. I know that all of you understand all the stories in the Gospels about the Apostle Peter, right? I mean, he's the guy that continually stuck his foot in his mouth. He's the one that Jesus always had to correct. But bless his heart. When the Holy Spirit fell upon him, the man that just a few days prior had denied Jesus three times stands up in a hostile crowd and delivers one of the finest sermons that have ever been seen in the church age. Amen. And we're going to look at it. Verse 14, it says, Peter stood up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. Let this be known to you and give ear to my words. These people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Now, as we go through this sermon this morning, uh, and I'll point each one out to you, Peter quotes three Old Testament prophecies to illustrate what God was doing on the day of Pentecost. Now, I don't know about you, but to stand up extemporaneously and quote three Old Testament prophecies is hard to do. Amen. And I'm impressed. You know, I kid a lot about Peter because there's so many funny things about him. But the man knew the word of God. Clearly he did because he was able to stand up and quote. One of them, the first one, is from this uh, book of Joel in the Old Testament we're going to look at. It. But the point is, and you know me, and what I think about prophecy, I think I've been abundantly clear. I love studying the prophetic scriptures of God. The reason I do is because it tells me that if God can tell me before it ever happens what's going to happen, if he can tell me the end from the beginning, if he can tell me what the shape of the world's going to be in and what transpires in it before it ever comes, it means that, that uh, history is not haphazard. All right? Uh, 
You're probably like me. You're looking around at this world right now, some of you, particularly some of you that got a few years on you. And you're saying, what is going on in this country? What is happening to this culture, to this world that I grew up in? It appears to be total chaos and destruction. Yet prophecy, as we're going to see these three that Peter quotes, teaches us that history is not chaotic, it is not haphazard, there's a meaning to it, and every word of God is true that describes what its end will be. Amen. See, the early church, they believed in the second coming. As I've told you before, one out of every 20 verses in the New Testament is about the second coming. That tells me it's a priority. The second coming is a great truth. And it, likewise, teaches us what? It teaches us there is an end. There is a consummation. That this craziness that we perceive from a human level is not going to go on forever. There's going to come a day when God terminates human history Amen. and sends Jesus back to this earth to make everything right. Now, I want to say, before I get into Joel here, on this day that we're studying that Peter preached, the early church, the first roots of our church, they were 100% Jewish people. Yes. This took place in Jerusalem at the Holy Temple. All the people that were there had come, it tells us explicitly in the scripture, they had come from all over the Roman Empire for Passover. And they were Jewish people. Now later on, they're going to introduce the gospel to some Gentile people, and that'll become part of the church. But at this point, keep in mind that it's a Jewish church. Acts 1-8, Jesus said what? He told everybody, he said, you're going to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. That's where we are today. In Judea, the state where Jerusalem is. Samaria, an outer part of Israel, and then what? To the uttermost parts of the earth. And we're going to see it unfold in Acts as we study it. I want to point out to you before I get into this, notice in verse 14, it said, Peter standing with who? The eleven. The eleven. And so, you know, you might say, well, I thought one of them hung himself. Well, he did. So you remember what they did? They cast lots and they picked Matthias to be the replacement apostle. And so here we are. We've got 12 apostles again, just like Jesus created. Now, let's, let's go on and look at this prophecy of Joel. Peter says, this is that that was spoken of by the prophet jo Joel. So in other words, uh, Picture in your mind this day, this particular day in history. What had happened? There had come the sound of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were. And then tongues of fire came down and set upon the heads of each one that was present, right? You remember that? Yeah. And then the crowd started gathering, saying, what's going on? What is all this? And all the 120 Christians, what were they doing? They were praising God and talking about the wonderful works of God, right? You remember that? All right, so the crowd's confused about what's going on. Peter stands up with the 11. What's he do? He says, let's have a Bible study. Yeah. It wasn't the tongues and it wasn't the flames of fire that created the opportunity for the church to grow. It was the preaching of the gospel. Let's have a Bible study. And so he turns to the prophet. The prophet Joel. Let me read it first, and then we'll go back and talk about it. Verse 17, it says, In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see divisions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I'll pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I'll show wonders in the heavens above, signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, and the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great day of the Lord comes, 
the great and magnificent day. And it, was, it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Now those, those verses there, that's a prophecy from Joel, Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. Now, uh, thinking critically, thinking deeply, when you look at that section of prophecy there, and then you look at the day of Pentecost, you can immediately see that all of these things didn't happen on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was poured out as the beginning uh, of the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. And it's possible to say that with certainty if you look back at that passage from Joel. And it says down in verse 20 that these things happen right before what? The day of the Lord. What's the day of the Lord? That's when Jesus comes back. The second coming. It's after the rapture. All of these signs, sons and daughters prophesying, visions, dreams, wonders, signs, blood, fire, smoke, darkness, and blood, all of that is an apt description of the great tribulation that's coming upon this world, possibly very soon. So, Joel's prophecy is for the church age. Hang on to that, because it's from the day of Pentecost until the day that Jesus Christ returns at the second coming. The point of the prophecy as far as Peter's concerned is this. The day of Pentecost was something new. God fulfilled his promise given in the Old Testament that there was going to come a day when the Holy Spirit would not just, you know, like, come on Carol and then leave. Come on Lynn and then leave. Rather, he promised that the Holy Spirit was going to come upon every one of his children, indwell them, and permanently stay there, never to leave again. Amen. That's what the day of Pentecost is about. So all Peter's trying to say is this. All you people that are confused and perplexed and amazed about what's going on here, don't be. Because the God of the Old Testament, the God that we worship, he promised us a long time ago that he was going to pour his spirit out on everybody. Amen. And that's what this is. That's what the day of Pentecost is. I find it helpful to understand, and I believe this is true, that all of that vast crowd, and there were thousands of people gathered around by this point. I think it goes without saying that these are people that knew their, their scriptures. And why do I say that? Well, it's because they represent people from every nation of the Roman Empire that had traveled at their own hazard to come to Jerusalem for the Passover. Yes. Now, if they didn't care, they would have stayed in Rome. If they didn't care, they wouldn't have traveled from Iraq and Iran and from Turkey and from North Africa all the way to Jerusalem to worship. These were people of faith. Yes. These were people that understood their Old Testament scriptures. And so Peter's helping them along here, don't you see? He's showing them this should not be strange to you, what you're seeing and hearing. Because God's promised this a long time ago in the Old Testament. Verse 22, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God, with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Yes. But God raised him up, loosing the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it, that is, death. Amen. Now I want you to notice, look, look, in your, look in your scripture there, verse 23, something very important is stated by Peter. Jesus was delivered up. He was handed over by the definite plan and knowledge, rather foreknowledge of God. Yet, 
All of you crucified him and yeah. killed him. Now there's two things going on there. If you don't feel the tension, you didn't read the scripture right there. Number one, it tells us that God ordained and delivered up Jesus to the cross. He died because of the plan of God. It was not an accident. It was not an afterthought. It was not something that just men cooked up. Rather, it was the plan of God, right? So we got that right. Okay, Father, we understand that. But it turns right around then in that little verse, and it tells us what? That all the people that did it were responsible yeah. for the death of Jesus yeah. Christ. So we've got election, predestination, foreknowledge, <clears throat> and we've got free will. Those people will be held accountable for killing him on the cross. And I heard somebody out there just now say, <coughs> excuse me, say, Jim, explain that to me. How can it be foreknowledge and how can it be free will? Well, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I can't. I would if I could, but I can't. It's one of the paradoxes that exist in the Holy Scriptures. It's throughout the scriptures in many places. And we're not going to understand it this side of heaven. That's right. You know, I'm fine with that. All right. I want to say, looking at verse 23, something important. This is something everybody needs to file away and make it part of your theology. If you have studied history at all, you know of the abhorrent things that have been done by the Christian church to the Jewish people. For centuries it was taught in the church that the Jews were responsible for the death of Christ. And this way of thinking led to the Holocaust of World War II. Yes. It was that kind of theology that Adolf Hitler adopted. It led to the Russian pogroms of the 20th century where hundreds of thousands of Jews were slaughtered in Russia. It read, led to the expulsion of all Jews from the countries of Spain, Portugal, and England. It led to thousands and thousands of Jews being murdered during the Crusades. Yes, sir. Now, in point of fact, I want to say this, and I believe the scripture backs me up. There were Jewish people responsible that day, and there were Roman <coughs> administrators and soldiers that were responsible that day. They killed him. But if you've ever read the scriptures with open hearts and open minds, you know very clearly what it teaches is the year of the war killed him. That it was my sin that killed him. That it was the sin of the whole world that he carried on his back when he died on the cross. It was not a murder. It was not an execution even. <clears throat> what it was was a, a sacrifice. A living sacrifice that he gave up his life allowed himself to be nailed to the cross and God came in his sovereign might and power and placed your sin, I'm talking to you, each one of you, and my sin, and he, he took it personally, itemized and clear, every one of them, and he laid them upon his son. Yes, sir. And that's what got him killed, right? You understand? So anti-Semitism has no place in a Christian's heart. No place. It's been one of the most horrendous things that the church has committed over the centuries. And we need to always be aware and put it down if you're ever around. Okay, let's, let's go on. Verse 25, where it says another quotation of this blessed Peter here. How he does this, I don't know. He's going to quote now our second prophecy from Scripture from the Old Testament, Psalm 16. Yes. 
David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I might not be shaken, and therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You made known to me the paths of life, and you'll make me full of gladness with your, pres with your presence. And that's the end of Psalms. 16. Now verse 29, Peter. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us today. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God, God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, and of that we're all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he was poured out to us today that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Amen. So we've got a prophecy, right? Got a few verses of a prophecy. Then what have we got? We got Peter giving a commentary. He's explaining what the prophecy means. David says that the Lord Jesus was crucified. He bore the wrath of God. That's the gospel message. Notice it says in Psalm 16 that he is dead and buried. This, this sermon here that we're looking at today, <clears throat> you know, it's interesting. They talk on the day of Pentecost about him being in the upper room. Um, and I can't, I, I can't say this with certainty, but this, this I know. I've been there and I've seen the upper room and maybe the 120 could have got in there, but it would have been difficult, right? It's like, uh, can I come over to your house with 120 people and put them in there? You know, it'd be difficult, right? I hope it would. It wouldn't mind. But here's the thing. I think by this time, by this point when Peter is preaching, they had spilled out of that upper room, which by the way, in Jerusalem, it's just right across the street from the temple. Yes. I think they had spilled out of there and the crowds gathering, seeing all these things happening, right? And they were on the steps of the temple. That's what I believe. I don't know if that's true or not, but it seems to be logical. So they're all gathered outside there. And Peter says that David, King David, right? He lived a thousand years before this took place, the day of Pentecost, a thousand years. At that day that Peter preached, his tomb was still there in Jerusalem. And he pointed at it and he said, David is dead and buried right there. Now that tomb's not there today. They haven't found it anyway. I don't know what happened to it. <clears throat> but his point is, David was not writing Psalm 16 about himself. He was writing it about Jesus Christ. Amen. David's dead and buried and he still is. But Jesus Christ was dead and he was buried but he's not anymore. God would not suffer him, allow him to stay in Hades, Amen. to stay dead. What did he do? He, wrote, he raised him up. <clears throat> but something interesting, and I know each and every one of you study your Bible on your own during the week. Many of you probably got some tools to help you study the Bible, and that's good. But here's, here's something I want to share with you. This passage teaches us a principle of interpretation. For instance, let me ask you this. When you read Psalm 16, verses 25 through 28 there, you might read that and say, well, I don't see where it says Jesus rose from the dead. But I want to tell you something. The Holy Spirit inspired all the scriptures, right? you believe that? Amen. Okay, the Holy Spirit gave us the text we're studying this morning and Peter's preaching 
And he says, through the Holy Spirit working in him that day, that <coughs> Psalm 16 is about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Let that be a help to you when you're, when you're doing your own personal study and meditation on scriptures. Pray and ask the Holy Spirit to illumine your heart what passages mean. Now you also need commentaries and other helps and all that. I'm not saying something like that. I am saying this, that the scriptures are about Jesus Christ. Amen. These are they which testify of me, he said. And if we pray and ask the Holy Spirit to, to open up our heart, our spirit, our, our, our mind, he is able to tell us what passages mean in prophetic scriptures like this. It's something we should do. Amen. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he, he himself said, The Lord said to my hand, uh, excuse me, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that as God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus who you crucified. That's from Psalms 110. Yes. That's our third prophecy, right, that Peter's going to do today? He's done, he's done three. He's done Joel, he's done Psalms by David, and now he's in Psalms 110. Something curious there. I want you to look at that phrase. Tell me what it means. The Lord said to my Lord. Yes. Do you find that curious? Huh? Yeah. You know why it's, 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 it's not clear? <laughs> It's because we're not reading it in the Greek or the original Hebrew. In the Hebrew Bible, this says, instead of the Lord said to my Lord, it said Jehovah said to Adonai. Yes. Why the translators didn't tell us that, I don't know. But that's what it says. In other words, Yahweh or Jehovah, who's that? God the Father, said to him, Adonai. Christus, Jesus, the Messiah. Yes. It's a conversation between the Father and the Son. Now look, let's look at it now. The Father said to Jesus, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Does that help? Amen. It makes it a little clearer, doesn't it? What does that mean? It means exactly what we've been studying here. That with the death, burial, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, where'd he go? He went to heaven. He sits at the right hand of the Father. What's going on? Why is he doing that? Well, a couple of reasons, but the main one is right here. Until the Father makes all of his enemies his footstool. Yes. And that, friends, is what is going on when you watch the news on TV. Amen. It is. God is executing a sovereign plan in all the details of this world. And no matter how out of control, evil, mixed up it seems, have faith in God. That its conclusion will be exactly what the scripture says. That the Lord Jesus Christ, Adonai, will return to this earth as a victorious warrior. He will destroy all the confusing things that you see on your TV. Amen. In a moment, mm -hmm. in a breath, and upon completion of that, he's going to take his seat on the throne of David in Jerusalem. You're going to see it. You'll get to go there, I think. And he's going to rule and reign on the earth for a thousand-year millennium. And all of his enemies, his footstool. Amen. Nothing more than a footstool. I hope that helps you. It helps me. Because I'm like you. I get frustrated when I watch what's going on in this world. And we don't need to be. Verse 36. Let all the house of Israel know, therefore, for certain, that God has made him Lord in Christ, this Jesus whom he crucified. So that's kind of the end of the sermon. Look at verse 37. 
Now when, the, when they heard this, who heard this? All the Jewish people, right? So when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Amen. Uh, notice this, Peter didn't give an invitation. Peter gave a sermon, and it was so true that it cut their hearts, and they gave their own invitation. They came to Peter, what should we do? Yeah. This is bad news. We've crucified the Son of God. What are we supposed to do in order to get right with God? Three things. Repent, be baptized in water, and three, receive the forgiveness of your sins, which will give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You remember last week when we talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Not filling them, the baptism. It happens to everybody the day they get saved. Here it is again. The promise of the Father, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, baptized with fire. What happens, according to Peter, is people that are convicted of their sins and say, what should we do, should do these things. To repent is to have a new mind, to feel sorry, to turn away, to think about Jesus differently than you did before. That he's not just a man. He's not just a prophet or a good teacher. He is the Son of God. And you change your heart and your mind toward him. To be baptized. In the early church, friends, I want to say this, and I hope it convicts anybody, somebody. They associated being saved with being baptized. Now, don't hear me, hear me wrong. No. They didn't believe that being baptized saved you. They just believed that when you accepted Christ and you were born again, you wanted to get baptized right then. That's right. As a matter of fact, this passage of Scripture, the day that he preached this sermon, the first day of the church, 3,000 people responded to his sermon right there in the temple. Yes. And guess what? They all got baptized right there at the temple. See? Now, I'm just saying that. I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad or do that. I love, I love y'all. But being a Christian and accepting Christ and being born again means that he wants you to be baptized in water. Now, <clears throat> you can be saved... And the moment you do, you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All right? right? You don't have to be baptized in water to receive that. Every Christian that comes to Christ and repents <clears throat> and believes receives the Holy Spirit. But I'm telling you, if you study your scriptures, you'll find in Acts and in the four Gospels that when people got saved back then, they got baptized. Amen. So you, you think about it. We're going to have to go real quick here. So those that received his word were baptized, verse 41, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Uh, I, want you to, I want you to visualize this. It's really easy to see. They're in Jerusalem right after Passover and first fruits. These people are from all over the Roman Empire, right? They're from everywhere. And so 3,000 of them, that day of Pentecost, bowed their knees, repented of their sins, believed in Jesus, and then were baptized in the water, and then were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Right? We're all clear on that, right? Yeah. I want you to think about, though, the next day, the next week. All of these people scattered back out to where they lived around the Roman Empire. They went all over the Roman Empire. They went to Rome, for goodness sake, the capital of civilization back then. That's, that's why uh, when Paul wrote his letters, he wrote to the Christians in Rome. Why did he do that? Because there were some of them, and I think it was from this day, 
that went all the way back there to Rome, they started a house church. Yes. Priscilla and Aquila, we studied. We'll study about them in a couple of weeks. They were there in Rome, in a church. I think these people scattered out all over the Roman Empire and evangelized. I think the, they just shared what Jesus had done for them, what they did on the day of Pentecost when they repented of their sins, put their confidence and trust in Jesus Christ, were water baptized, and the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Man, they want to tell people about it. And they did. And that's the birth of the church right there. Birth of the church. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning to be in your house. And we thank you for the testimony that the written scriptures give us. Lord, we are so blessed to have it, both the Old and the New Testaments. Father, we pray to thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray this morning, Father, that you would fill with your spirit each and every one here. I pray, Lord, we're lifting up our hearts to you right now at this moment and saying we surrender to you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we give you our hearts. We come to you in repentance for our sin. We ask you to let the spirit who indwells us rule in our hearts. Father, we pray, we pray that it will overflow out of our mouths. The wonderful works of God. Praise in the Lord Jesus. For we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Amen.